joining us today for Emka's Warrior Arts of the Hellenes from Ancient Times to the Modern Era. This panel discussion uh, is in association with AHEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission. My name is Lou Katzos and I'm the president of EMCA, the East Medi Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance and the chairman of AHEPA's Hellenic Cultural Commission. Our distinguished and very accomplished mar martial artists uh, uh, today are president of the Pamacon uh, Cultural Union, author, engineer, Costas Derveñez. Uh, welcome, Costa. Uh, Amakian instructor, uh, martial artist, technologist, Eric Hill. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Mom. Renowned karate master instructor and world champion uh, in Kobudo and author, Catherine Lukopoulos. Welcome, Catherine. Hello, everyone. Martial artist, instructor, author, uh, investment fund attorney, Peter Siragotis. Uh, welcome, Peter. Thanks. Honored to be and, here. And martial artist, international investment officer, Dimitri Koriatis. Welcome, Hello. Dimitri. Thank you. Uh, martial arts and combat sports in Greece uh, have a long and documented history going back to the Minoan era and reaching all the way into the uh, modern age. Long before the celebrated samurai of Japan even existed, the warriors of ancient Alas achieved legendary status in the battlefield. Over the millennia, martial arts in Greece in, uh, evolved. Uh, the historical uh, course followed the development of mil military strategy and the necessary responses that new uh, weapons dictated. Uh, and uh, it led obviously to hand-to-hand -hand fighting and me melee uh, combat. More than just a means of uh, close quarter combat, uh, Hellenic martial arts is also a means of strengthening character, fortifying the mind, body, and spirit. The panel uh, will discuss the history and evolution of martial arts and combat sports in uh, ancient, uh, uh, all the way up into modern Greece, how they may be practiced today to allow the practitioner to thrive in the turmoil of the modern world and how they may be uh, uh, propagated as a cultural artifact for the empowerment of Hellenic society around the world today. Uh, before, we start, uh, before we start our panel discussion, uh, which is a very important one, I'd like us to just take a moment of silence uh, because today is um, 98 years ago uh, was the start of the uh, Smyrna catastrophe where approximately 100,000 Greeks and Armenians were exterminated. A moment of silence, please. Costa, if we can, I'd like to start the conversation with you. Obviously, we've known each other for for a few years and we are, uh, we have met in Greece and, uh, and the United States. And uh, certainly uh, we get together on social media. If you can, uh, for this conversation, uh, lay out, the, let's say the table, uh, the menu, if you will, of what we will be discussing today. Sure, Lou. Well, you know, the, there are records of both close quarter combat, which today we'll call martial arts, and combat sports like boxing and wrestling and grappling, uh, going back four or even 5,000 years. And we know that these records, these archaeological records exist in Hellas going all, back, all the way back until the second millennium, right around uh, 1,900 BC uh, in the Minoan era. Th there is no question that these people practiced, our ancestors practiced both combat sports and martial arts. The application of martial arts went beyond the necessities of, of military strategy. They had integrated deep into society. And in fact, those of us, all of us here, for example, that have studied Eastern martial arts, know that what you do is an expression of yourself. Yeah. So Every nationality that takes a, a martial art, it expresses it uh, as its own inner self in many respects. Uh, there's also a, a governmental and, and a, and a uh, 
cultural, let's say, uh, paradigm that attaches itself to it. But in the end, we are basically displaying ourselves when we're uh, practicing martial arts, when we're displaying martial arts, when we're, when we're creating them, when we're doing all these things. So the question is, what we, the structure that we'll be following is that, okay, we have records of Hellenic martial arts and combat sports going all the way back to 4,000 years ago. How did they evolve? Why did they evolve? How are combat sports different from martial arts? What are the contributions of both of these entities, both the combat sports and the martial arts to society? How did the evolution of martial arts follow the fate of Greek society? And what can we today learn from this path all the way up to the modern era? Thank you, Costa, for that. And, and just to, you know, just to discuss a little bit about our participants, let me, let me just uh, bring up some information regarding uh, Costa's Derveños. Uh, Costa has studied martial arts for more than 50 years. Uh, throughout his life, uh, he, he has trained in karate, judo, jujitsu, ninpo, taijutsu, kung fu, and tai chi chuan, as well as Western boxing and fencing, uh, retaining high ranks in traditional Japanese jujitsu and bujutsu. A renowned author and researcher in martial arts uh, and, and its history, his work has influenced Bethany Hughes in her book, Helen of Troy. By the way, Helen of Troy, just so you know, uh, Costa, was from Pelada, okay? And uh, since, I, si since, I am, since I am from the Pelada region, I thought I'd bring that up. And, uh, and Costa was cited as an expert on uh, Bronze Age combat. And uh, he appeared, or his work appeared actually, in a documentary that was put together uh, based on his book, The Martial Arts of Ancient Greece, uh, which, in uh, which is included as a reference uh, for the degree program in the U.S. Army uh, War College. He is a consistent collaborator of the Hellenic Armed Forces and, and NATO's uh, Maritime Inviction Operational Training Center in Crete. His paper, his well-known paper, The Neurophysiological and Evolutionary Considerations of Close Combat, a Modular Approach, which was derived from his work with the Hellenic military received the honorary distinction uh, at the fourth International Medical Olympiad. Costa is the current headmaster of the uh, traditional martial art education system of Pamahon. Professionally, he is an engineer, having served in the past as the engineering manager of the original Greek F-16 program, and currently working as a senior sales manager in the software industry in Brussels, Belgium. Uh, Costa is coming uh, to us from, uh, from Belgium. So this is an international uh, conversation. Eric, uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me ask you a question, Eric. Sure. I've noticed, uh, you know, Hellenic cultural artifacts the, uh, depicting, uh, depicting uh, let's say, warriors striking with a fist vertically through, mul uh, through multiple millennia. What do you think of this and uh, what is behind it? So, so that's actually... Uh very easy to answer. So if you think about humans being tool users um, and actually striking barefisted. So a lot of people think of striking as what you think about boxing. But the reason you're seeing vertical fists, one, it's safer anatomically for your fist, but two, it's the same way you're going to use a lot of implements. Uh, I train barefisted. I don't use bags and I hit heavy equipment. I've used, I've Typically when I train too, I, I train folks by talking through time, especially the use of the diaspora here. So I'll talk to artifacts on the Parthenon, walk through time, even the bronze you saw me post, and I'll show them the mechanics live. So when you can see you hit, hitting with power and seeing me hitting bare knuckle, you say, wait a minute, he's not wearing any wraps or anything. So you start to understand by engagement how mechanically uh, you are moving. And as, as we have discussed endlessly with Costa, there's a lot of mechanics involved, um, which gets into what well, Costa's writing on neurophysiological model, where a lot, there's a lot, a lot of focus on spinal movement. So if you, if you tie in a vertical fist, have you ever seen the pictures of English boxers in the 1800s? Bare yes. knuckles? Yeah, like, yeah. First, how are they punching? Bare knuckle vertical. Right? 
So if you think about transposing through time, if you pay close attention to their stances, you go, hey, wait a minute. Those aren't too far off from those ancient, that ancient Greek works we saw. Now, we do have some pictures, but as, as you know, the conditions of Greece didn't allow uh, for certain things to happen. But we, if you look through the era, there's a consistency there that Costa actually notes in another book he wrote extremely well um, and actually even ties into many other things. Eric, let me let me ask you another question, because many times on social media, I see you with uh, the uh, Hellenic Fustanella, quite frankly, with your with your blade. And also also you and uh, a, a, a group of young people are always you always post yourselves in the in the dancing Greek dances. Now, my thought was always that Greek dancing had something to do with the martial arts, to tell you the truth, because because I like, you know, from a youth, I like to dance myself and um, Tell us a little bit about that and, and just the dance and, and martial arts. So, so what is there, so of course as a culturalist too, I know Peter is. Um, when you go, when you go, go through, and I've been engaged in the Hellenic for a very long time and you always hear these whispers, you know, our ancestors embedded these movements in dance. So when you unwind what I just said about vertical fist, fist striking, your spine, sing, and get into single waiting, you also talk about horizontal and, and linear movement. Once you understand mechanics and you pull apart dances, there are whispers, for instance, Sami. Of course, everyone knows Sarah and Pitsak Klein, but things were forgotten over the years. So if you look at, say, Pondian, so there's some video from the 60s, it's danced different now. Even the dance with swords from Cappadocia is performed different. If you look at even, even there's a Cypriot dance with the Dropani, okay? If you want, and I learned it the traditional way, the footwork is the same as the dance of swords, done the old way, not with people making up stances. But if you watch their footwork, it's done in a very specific way. So you go from a drapani to a sword, and they're moving in the same manner, in the old way, not the way where people make things up. For instance, I've seen uh, young dancers learning things with, not the the short form, you'll see certain dances. They're dancing with wooden curved swords. Well. I happen to know a lot of people aren't taught how to use even knives. So you'll see people mounting them uh, in a way that wasn't wasn't useful on us because they're just, just dancing. Whereas dancers two generations ago would have known how to use knives and taken a lot of things for granted. Same thing with footwork, right? So after a generation, you're not you're not using these implements, you're moving a certain way, you start to add little changes over time. So some of these dances have drifted. You can look at some of the old videos and say, wait a minute, they're moving differently. That is why. These people knew how to use the implements. So when I train young people, I actually train them. So I'm not only going to walk them through artifacts, I walk them through certain Hellenic dances. And then they go, wait a minute. That's why I prefer to work with Hellenic dances. There's also a scientific reason, because I know the ligament tendon structure is strengthened, because the movement itself strengthens a certain way. And as you know, there's certain other drills I do myself. But that's actually very important to footwork and even mechanically striking. I told you I hit on heavy equipment. I'm able to do it a certain way because of ligament strength. And I do attribute a lot of that to Hellenic dance, believe it or not. People don't believe it until they see it. No, no, I believe it. Uh, my favorite dance is at Samiko, by the way. A little, a little, uh, a little, uh, a little information about Eric. Uh, Eric has 35 years of experience in the warrior arts. Over that time frame, he has appeared in various outlets of significance to the martial genre. Uh, via a series of events uh, which are ongoing, Eric uh, began a collaboration with Costa de Venus, uh, who we introduced a little bit earlier, in uh, 2014, where he adopted Costa's scientific and cultural platform of uh, Pamahon. He is a, a volunteer director uh, of the U.S. Hellenic Combatives Program, a great program, by the way, Eric, for youth uh, in the U.S. Uh, Hellenic community. Uh, Eric has engineered the Hellenic Combatives Kits uh, over a series of trials. They have been adopted in nearly all aspects of the U.S. program as they were found to accelerate skills for all age groups. Catherine, uh, Catherine you, you, you impress, I have to, I have to admit. Um, when, when, I saw, when I saw that video of the 50-year celebration of Greece, I was inspired, quite frankly, uh, and I said to myself, even though I'm uh, probably the oldest person today on uh, on this uh, on this discussion, I said to myself, this is interesting. Maybe maybe I can get involved in this. But Catherine, I have to admit, uh, even though you showed all the various uh, instructors, teachers that you've had 
uh, or people who are well known in the uh, martial arts uh, over the 50 year period. One thing that impressed me the most, this will sound strange to everybody here, but, but you took within that video of all these fighters, uh, you showed a sequence uh, where uh, a group went to Delphi. Uh, and what, what, what was that about? I, I thought that was like amazing. What was that about? Um, I have a habit when I do events, if, uh, if I do events that uh, last two days or more, I break it up with a cultural trip. So um, it's a break for the practitioners, but it's also an education educational trip pertaining how many days they can stay. In the video that you saw, the event was five days, actually was 11 days, but uh, the main event was five days. So we broke it off by Wednesday going to Delphi. And uh, as soon as we got there, maybe half hour, um, the fire department had to ask us to leave because the mountain was burning. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> well, it, it was a nice experience for the foreign instructors because since they were not burned, they will have the experience to relate to people. Hey, we went to Greece, we went to Delphi, and uh, <laughs> there was a fire and helicopters were roaming above. And anyway, so it was memorable. Um, Greece has uh, many places to feature. So as long as we are well, and as long as I have events, there will be many places to see and things to do. A little advertisement here. <laughs> no, it's okay. One, one of the things, uh, I, I have to be frank, one of the things that was uh, sort of shocking to me, when they were, when they were in Delphi, they were, they were, you know, besides the classical music that you had played uh, during the Delphi trip in the, in the video, one of the, things, uh, one of the things that sort of shocked me was I'm looking at these scenes from Delphi and all of a sudden, all of a sudden the bronze, uh, you know, serpentine column appears in that, yeah. in that scene. And, and we know that the serpentine column, which, which uh, no, known uh, in many cases as the pl uh, Platean tripod, is actually in Constantinople. So yeah. Yeah. what was that about? What was that about? What was that about? I don't, I don't know exactly the story. I think that the Reveni sensei probably knows it better than me. <laughs> am, I, am I passing the buck? No, no, before, before we get to Costa, let me, let, me, let me say the following. For you to show that scene in Delphi, you know, uh, you know these ancient things must, must have, a, have a meaning to you. In other words, even in martial arts, in other words, Putting it in the martial arts film to me stated in my mind that that something is within you, in terms of the martial arts that relates to all these classical. Well, things. I, I don't I don't want to take the time and relate to the martial arts in the spiritual and philosophical way because we are short of time and we have a, a lot of things to cover. But of course, because Pythia, the um, the person uh, in Delphi was the fortune teller or future teller and was visited by all generals and uh, warriors to learn what is the possibility, the outcome of success or failure. And uh, I have similar things. I don't have pity. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one, one of the people who did, uh, who did visit, obviously, Delphi was uh, King Leonidas. And a couple of weeks ago, we did uh, an event relating to the 2500th anniversary of the Battle of Thermopylae. And one of the things that the Pythia did say to him is that uh, a king must die in order, in order for the Greeks to survive. So, so obviously, the Pythia had some words for him. A few words about uh, Catherine, uh, who's, who's just an amazing, amazing individual. It's just... It's just shocking to me, quite no, frankly, what no, you've done, what no. you've done in your life. No, 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 no. I got to bring it up. I got to bring it up. 
uh, Catherine has practiced uh, karate, uh, started practicing karate 50 years ago in New York City. Uh, you did get your master's, obviously. You lived in New York and got your master's in forensic uh, psychology and criminology uh, from the John Jay, uh, John Jay School. She was a member of the U.S. National Karate Team for seven years. All that Samata, Samata. Her achievements, her achievements included ten times All American, three times All Around All American, Pan American Championships, and and the World Games title from 1979 to 1985. She moved to Okinawa for 15 years in order to st uh, study in depth the martial arts and is one of the foremost Western scholars, uh, scholars of, of, of these arts. She wrote and developed standing operational procedures for the US Marine Corps martial arts program in the Pacific and it's was the inducted- the, the line program. The line program, it's a boot camp program. Okay. And was inducted in the USA Martial Arts Hall of Fame in 1985 and 2019. You, you know, are too shy, you are too shy, you are too shy. No, it, uh, I was inducted in, um, when I was competing for the US, um, I found out that the name Lukopoulos, um, people couldn't pronounce it. And there is a rule that says, uh, if you're called on the mat, um, three times you're out. Twice, the second time you have to appear on the map. But I never knew that they were calling me because they were pronouncing my name wrong. So my coach <laughs> said, <laughs> and my coach said, um, you have to do something up about your name. And I, I thought since kata is, is a judgmental sport, I thought of a name that Baxter. So. The Hall of Fame in 1985, at the conclusion of my amateur career, is 1985 Baxter. But I have been active all along, and they thought, this woman, we haven't uh, inducted her in the Hall of Fame. And I have been inducted again, but my name is Lucopoulos. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> I, am, I am so old. <laughs> that no, you, no, no, no. The, the oldest person here is me. The oldest person here is me. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> no, no, no. I saw it when you graduated from CCNY, and I'm the oldest oh, person no. here. That, that is because I went to night school. I worked. I was an immigrant in the States. So I worked during the day. I went to night school. So it, um, it takes a longer time. Listen, I have to beat you in something. So, so let me let me beat you. Let me beat you in the age, uh, Peter. Let me Peter. Let me ask you. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, we we have all seen the frescoes in uh, in Akrotiri, where we see the boxes with one hand covered and the other hand open. What is your interpretation of what they are doing? Well, so it's interesting. The I've seen those in Greece. Um, actually, two years ago, I was privileged enough to actually walk through Akrotiri, which was just an amazing experience for me. Um, I've always wanted to. But linking it back, you know, when you look at it, you're tempted to think that these are boxers in the sense of boxing the way we understand it. We have striking on both left and right hands. But when we look at it, we notice that one hand is wrapped and one hand is opened. And the technique that one of the uh, youth is using is he's blinding or manipulating the other person and the other hand is getting poised to hit. So to me, that actually looks more like a type of training that gets people ready for traditional warfare in the ancient world, which was short, which was a, a shield and a sword. There's two types of training and there's more types. One is muscle memory, but there's also a conceptual part. How do you train your body to understand the realities of the combat. So what I, what the way I interpret it is they're teaching the students to use their left hand to manipulate their, their opponent, much like you would use it as a shield to parry, to block, to push your opponent forward, to get them off balance so that you can use then your right hand, which is wrapped in the thing to stab or to use a spear to strike. And so while we think of it as boxing, I think it was very different. I think they were trying to teach them to use their left hand and their right hand 
at the same time, but in different ways and to get that sort of understanding into their system. Happy to hear from other people from the panel and what they think as well, but I think it's a very interesting sort of way of, of, of looking at it. We'll, we'll get there in a second. Uh, a few words about uh, Peter. Uh, Peter has been training uh, in the martial arts for over 40 years and uh, in, a, in a dozen martial art forms uh, from around the globe. Uh, he was a member of the uh, 2002 U.S. Uh, Boxe Francais team, a former vice president uh, of the U.S. Uh, Soviet uh, Federation, a former vice president of the Washington Wrestling Club, and author of Developing Body, Mind, and Spirit, A Parent's Guide to Martial Arts uh, Training for Kids. Uh, prior uh, to our current pandemic, uh, Peter has taught uh, a kids martial arts program based on Pamakon uh, at the Hellenic Center in the metropolitan DC area. He is a shareholder at an international law firm, which I'm not gonna mention, but I do know the name. And it's very, <laughs> and it's very prominent uh, where he practices uh, uh, corporate law. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for, uh, for being with us. Dimitri, um, let, me, let, me ask you, uh, uh, let me ask you a question uh, and, and relating to uh, martial arts versus uh, how people see, let's say, a real life. And uh, how do they apply to the current situation in Greece and its place in the uh, glo global community? So let me give you let me give you someone's uh, comment in this particular case. Since we're going, we're starting ancient. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, I want you to to just uh, opine on Archimedes' comment. Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. Dimitri. Uh, yes. Thank you, Lou. I, I think that's a. Uh very enlightening uh, quote. And it's certainly something that I feel that would be extremely um, really relevant in today's uh, um, uh, uh, situation, especially within uh, the, the Greek um, geographic area. So obviously, you know, Greece has uh, traditionally been in an area that had uh, lots of turmoil uh, and different migrations have caused, uh, you know, uh, different uh, uh, struggles to, to take place. And, um, you know, I, I think the ancient Greeks really um, said it well and, and practiced it well, where they looked at ways to, to leverage their strengths instead of just focusing in on, uh, you know, whether the opponent had 70 million people and they only had 10 million people. So they always seemed to be the underdogs. And, uh, but the spirit was there, but also the mental uh, discipline, I think, uh, has traditionally been there to outthink your opponent and to look for advantages uh, and, and identify their disadvantages. And I think martial arts in general, I think that's, that's exactly what martial arts teaches uh, students along with discipline, is think strategically and, and to figure out your opponent's weaknesses, figure out their strengths, uh, and stay away from those strengths and, and learn to neutralize them. Uh, and then in that regards, also figure out how to uh, capitalize on, on your strengths as well. So I think this is something that uh, certainly um, in Greece, it, it could certainly help. And, uh, you know, movements like Costas, uh, I think that's extremely important uh, in, 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 in the recipe of, uh, you know, both teaching the youth and inspiring them that, uh, you know, it, just because you're, you, you might see yourself at a disadvantage within whether that's in with the eu community or within the global community uh you know you really have to focus in on what you have and they have a rich history they have a rich culture they have a foundation knowledge that can be used both in the martial arts uh but also within uh, academic and, and physical uh aspects and i feel like uh you know that's certainly a quote that um should inspire that leverage what you have uh, to uh, to make the most uh, of what you're looking to do. Let me, do let me ask you a question. The freeze behind you is is, is from where? So 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 these are the Elgin marbles that are obviously uh, now currently in the UK. Yeah, no, no. That's why I brought it up because quite quite frankly, uh, when you, when you look at these scenes, and again relating to to the dance, if you will. When I look at the scenes, it, it, it almost seems to me that, that this is a part of a performance or a dance. Uh, in other words, uh, things that were taught in a, in a dancing format. Am I, am I wrong in this? In terms, of, in terms of the Acropolis in particular. 
Sure. I, I think the only comment that I can make, and probably uh, other people on the panel can, can speak more on, on the dancing. I know Eric Hill has a lot of uh, uh, knowledge within this uh, aspect. And based on his comments, I actually did a little bit of, of research and, and found that, uh, you know, in, in ancient Greece, uh, again, the, the dances were important and they were almost a form of training. But just an anecdotal experience for me is when I actually went to, to London and, and saw these marbles, um, and, and did the, uh, the, the virtual tour uh, or the audio tour. If you look at them correctly, it actually, it actually uh, seems like the marbles are actually moving. So they, they actually look like an actual, I guess, how cartoons are made. So uh, you can actually, if you, if you look at it in a uh, sequence and within the right timing, you get the feeling that it's actually coming alive and you see the horses moving and, and the battle scene uh, actually and, um, and the reason, the reason, the reason why I bring that up is basically, you know, a lot of these scenes relate to, you know, to the, let's say, the ritual of bringing the peplos, of bringing the peplos, on a yearly basis, uh, where where they would they would march into the Acropolis, you know, bringing in the peplos or the new, you know, clothes, let's say, to the uh, to the deity, and uh, and looking at these scenes, I, I imagine it's part of it's part of also of a performance, but, and we'll go to Costa in a second. Uh, you know who can prob who can describe maybe some of those movements because those movements in my mind are part of a I use the expression dance but in reality they're probably martial arts movements uh, you know of, of that time period a few words about uh, Dimitri for for the audience uh, Dimitri started practicing the martial arts when he was 14 years old he has studied several uh, uh, systems uh, including ta uh, uh, Taekwondo Mai Tai uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Greco-Roman wrestling, Western boxing, mixed uh, martial arts, and has earned the red sash in Wing Chun. He studied kung, uh, he taught kung fu to uh, ROTC uh, students during his college days at uh, U.S. Santa Barbara, and has served in the uh, Hellenic uh, Special Forces. He is currently working as a senior manager in international business development. I think in Hong Kong. You're involved in Hong Kong. Okay, because yes. I've been to Hong Kong and have my own involvement in Hong Kong and foreign uh, uh, direct investment uh, in New York City. Uh, the same thing in, in, you know, part of my life or part of my other businesses. So I, I thought your background was very interesting, Dimitri. Thank you so much. Costa, if you can, uh, please, uh, you know, just, just relating to my last uh, statement about what's behind uh, Dimitri, what's your thought on that? Well, l let me take it what Dimitri said and, and make an observation first before we go uh, into the question. Okay. Um, as Dimitri said, these are from the Elgin Marbles. And yes. where are the Elgin Marbles from? The Acropolis. So there are similar uh, representations of martial arts coming from, the, that survived to the modern day, uh, from uh, the Temple of Zeus in Olympia, from the Temple of Apollo at Basset, yeah? And uh, the, the Basse marbles and the Parthenon marbles are, are both at the uh, London Museum. So uh, the point of the matter is that something that, that uh, Catherine said earlier, these were very important to them. Yeah. I mean, it was, it's obvious that these movements, these uh, techniques, these manifestations, these presentations were very important to the ancient Greeks so much that they put them on their ancient temples. Okay, so in fact, it was so much a part of, of their daily lives, so much a part of what was holy to them, yeah, that, that uh, they uh, basically had these movements, uh, these arts uh, on their places of worship. So it was clearly not only very much a part of their lives, but up on a pedestal, quote unquote. So then you have these cultural artifacts, which are, are also strategic, but they're also very much a part of your society. And then the question arises, okay, how do I teach my kids? Well, you can't take a three-year-old and, and you know, start teaching him how to throw a punch or, or use a, a sword blade or something like that. You can't teach him to dance, okay? And like today, you know, there's no formal school for Greeks to go hunting. You just kind of tag along and, you know, you go with your uncle, your father, your this, your that, and Eventually, you go up and you learn how to hunt in the mountains. Well, I learned to, to, to uh, 
do traditional Greek dances in my village. I didn't go to a school. I didn't belong to a troop. I wasn't part of an organized, no. I just went to Panigiria as a kid and watched the people dance. And then I learned how to dance. And I believe the methodology of all these uh, Hellenic martial arts and combat sports, well, the combat sports were actually specialized. And they're also a little matter of controversy and we can discuss that later. As far as the martial arts, so how do you teach them? Well, you teach them how to walk a certain way. You teach them how to move a certain way. And what's better for that than social activities? You know, they're laying around there, they're playing some music and then, you know, they start a dance. So without being taught formally, which started at a much later age when they were indoctrinated into the military, children were taught the right way to move. They were taught uh, how to maintain their balance. They were taught uh, how to anatomically dispense force, if you will, uh, by simple social movements, dance. So it worked. Well, when, when, when we talk about the dance uh, and how you learned how to dance, the way I learned how to dance was, was from my parents. Okay, we okay. would go to dances and, you know, relatives, for example. And they, 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 they learned from their relatives who learned from their relatives who learned from their relatives. And uh, even though, again, I'm not involved in any of these martial arts or what have you, but I always thought of these things as, uh, as movements uh, that quite frankly related to, to strength to a certain degree, but also the movement, depending on how someone was holding you and how you were reacting, uh, the, uh, related to whether you fell down or not. So, for example, if you had someone who was holding you that was weak and you could see that they were weak, uh, your form of dancing was a little bit different. Uh, so so I, I totally agree. But let me let me take a quote uh, from you. And uh, I'd like you to comment on that. Uh, one of the quotes that you had, which I thought was very interesting in uh, one of the social media uh, posts was, once one understands the psychophysical mechanics of human movement, tactical awareness and the importance of extant cultural martial artifacts caught in art, uh, whether archeological relics, medieval drawings or photos can become an object of study for the advancement of human society. Mm. Let's talk about that, uh, you know, uh, and by the way, by the way, as, as we're talking now, as we're talking now, any other uh, participant uh, panelists who wants to join in, uh, please join in uh, in the conversation. Uh, and, and, and please do triple, just uh, just segue into. Uh, look, the the use of the of the martial arts to empower society is is as we've just mentioned, not something new, but in the middle of the 19th century in Europe, it became something organized, including in Greece. Okay. Uh, there is a uh, royal decree from 1865 saying you will go to the schools and, and do use what, what we call martial education to empower the kids. So from a very young age, they could learn uh, how to move uh, wielding implements, sticks, you know, that later when they grew and became adults became weapons and, and un unarmed and this and that. Now, the point of all this is, is that it was packaged under the guise of physical education, you want stronger people. It was packaged under the guise of martial education because as, as Catherine uh, pointed out, and she immediately saw one photo from Crete, hey, they're doing bayonet. Yes, they are. You know, So you have a bunch of uh, eight to 12 year olds doing bayonet training in the yard. The, the point of it was to pass on what's, what became citizen empowerment. Then it was a desirable thing. Why? Parts, a lot of Greece was still occupied. And a lot of the documentary evidence, the photos that we have, came from schools in occupied areas. So they taught, yeah, they taught, uh, they taught a methodology first in their own domain and then exported that to the conquered areas. And lo and behold, suddenly you have aware citizens, empowered citizens, citizens that will not just bow their head and say, ne pasamo, aferim, aferim. I'd like to take off on that, if I could, with yeah. two very cognate examples from the US program. And I'll make it clear, too, the program I'm doing here is an extension of what's been going on. Gus and I have been working closely when, I, when you opened for six years, I would say, 
So everything we've done here has been something we've been orchestrating. Um, I have two examples, one Peter knows about. So when I was approached to, to train a, a teenage girl, and of course I, well, Greek girl, who was being harassed at school. And it has been about a month and a half training. And of course, when we train, again, a lot of it is neurological. And a lot of it actually is mind training. It's not actually about being able to punch out, even though that plays a role. It's actually about navigating and and de-escalating out of circumstances. So I got a re reply, or actually a statement from her mother that somebody in school had sort of shorter. her. Now, previously she was brutally harassed by these girls. And at this point in time, which is why I was approached, after a month and a half of training, she turned around, zinged the shoe back, didn't do anything beyond what was done to her, and the girl screamed back, what are you doing? And she said, returning your shoe. <laughs> <laughs> On another yeah, screen. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead please. Uh, so instrumenting the program was very important to make things contextual. So I gave you, I, I, I intentionally started with the young because some people knew me in, in previous slides were doing some fairly serious things. So we started with really young. Slowly we moved up in age groups. And in 2016, um, I had engaged with young men in Florida and one of my trainees, no, I'm not responsible for any decisions after. What I did do is undergo what I call cognitive training with Paul Pavlakos. So in ancient times, they said the Spartans would send a general. I trained a general and sent the Spartans to the sons. <laughs> so when, the, when, the, when what had happened in February occurred, under his guidance, the sons of Pericles waited to see for reactions from the organizations. Well, within, they gave it three days, maybe four. Within that time period, they had in waiting a tool for uh, members of the U.S. Atlantic community to contact their representatives and senators. So I go from one example of a 12, 13-year-old girl keeping a level refrain to somebody else navigating to the structures of government. That's very interesting. Catherine, what, in the video that I cited a little bit earlier, uh, you showed a clip when you were younger. And as a matter of fact, uh, that particular clip had you with, 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 uh, with a, what was like a stick. And to, and, to cost us, and to cost us a point about people training with, uh, in uh, the modern days in areas that were occupied and they were training with sticks and all the rest of that. Tell us a little bit about, about those weapons uh, and I imagine they were trained, by the way, I imagine they were training in sticks in the occupied areas was because they didn't probably allow anyone to have any uh, formal weapons, quite frankly, to defend themselves. Catherine, can you speak I, on that? I, actually, I wanted, uh, uh, if I may, before, yeah, please. If we, before we get to modern weapons, uh, I would like to continue something from uh, Costa del Beni Sensei? Please, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, first of all, in, I, there is a marked difference between the training that were done in ancient times and during our more modern times uh, and our current times. In the older times, there were not distractions. The threat was real. There was whether the threat was from a animal or a person, the threat was real. And the technique had to work the first time. If the technique didn't work the first time, we didn't keep it because the person is dead. But if, <laughs> if the technique worked, they kept it. And so it became our Greek training. This was lost in um, the years, recent years, like uh, when I was a child. But the spirit was not lost. And no matter how many styles you know, how many kata you can do, forms, how many weapons you can handle, how many bullets you can fire, if you don't have a trained spirit, you're gonna lose. So less 
uh, less is more. And I will define that. When I was a child, we learned to jump fences, to climb trees. And when we fell down, we couldn't tell our parents. That's right. <laughs> in, in school, they would beat us up for getting hurt <laughs> for falling. Uh, no, no, they beat us. They beat us. There was corporal punishment. Absolutely. This is not allowed today. Uh, the training, the psychological, uh, spirit training was warfare training. We played with rocks. We threw, we used to throw each other rocks and you duck them, okay? Um, maybe sometimes you were hit, you were slow. <laughs> Try this today. Try it in America. Throw you a rock. You go, to, you go to jail. You go to jail in America. Exactly. So we have a lot of things now, a lot of style, sports, um, we have everything, but we don't need nothing of that because we have drones. You push a button, the whole uh, village goes down. Where is the spirit to that? You don't face the enemy. So there is a big difference about martial arts and masters of today and masters of yesterday. Right? There was an uh, Ale uh, um, mega selectors. Alexander the Great. Yes. Okay? And his troops, they faced their opponents. Genghis Khan faced their opponents. So the spirit is different. And today we can talk about the spirit, but believe me, we don't have it. Because we don't train for it, Yemen. <laughs> oh, yeah, man, yeah, man. Listen, you made you made you made me laugh with that. By the way, what you were saying about before, because I remember when I was uh, when I was when I was young, for example, I went on a hill during and I came down came down the hill, ended up injuring myself, but I walked home slowly. I had ripped up my shirt and everything. I was bleeding, but I walked home slowly and sort of slid into my room so my parents wouldn't see me. Because in yeah. those days, in those days, they would say, hey, T.A., you know, boom, they hit you again. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I just like to ask a question. How do you build a spirit that was the spirit of Leonidas in today's world? Tell me. Well, before, before uh, anyone tells you about that, I will say something about Leonidas. <laughs> I will say something about Leonidas. I agree with you about uh, Alexander. But also Leonidas, when, when, when finally these, uh, these troops were surrounded, they were fighting with their spears against the Persians. Event and eventually they went to hand-to-hand -hand combat, by the way, and they, and they fought and they died. Peter, would you like to join in this particular conversation? Sure. Well, with, with a middle name like Leonida, I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to pipe up. So, uh, but, but one of the things that I think we need to be very cognizant of when it came to Leonida, just historically, is that he was the third son. Technically, he was never supposed to be sort of in that line of kingship. So he went through the full training of the Agogi. You know, one could argue whether or not the first sons or the second sons went through the full training or not. Um, because they were expected to be king. No one expected him to be king. He went through the full agogi. No one pulled punches with him. Um, and you came out in a different sort of way than, if you will, sort of, you know, people, as they say, wear the uh, velvet shoes as opposed to the wooden shoes um, of ancient times. So I think the fact that Leonida was a type of king that went through the full-fledged training of the agogi, no holding back, no, you know, mercy. I think it developed that spirit that we that we just heard about, and he was ready to implement it when the time came. You know, if it had been someone else other than Lonida at the gates of fire, who knows if the results would have been different? But there is no substitute for putting a student through the crucible. There just isn't. It, it, you have to go through it. I, I we laugh. Because I tell my, my, my son and my children about some of the training I went through late 70s and early 80s 
in karate, that school would be shut down nowadays. I mean, it would be shut down, you know, child protective services would be coming in, um, the person would be arrested in handcuffs and dragged off to jail. And the question is, is, and you know, one of the things that we need to think about is as a society, are we better for it or are we worse for it? You know, um, I'm old fashioned. I believe in the old training techniques. Um, and I don't think that we're better for it. I, I think we lost something in it. Now, do I think there were some instructors in those days that took it a little too far and bordered on child endangerment? Probably. Um, and so that, you know, you have to temper it a little bit, but, you know, I, I think we've pampered them too much. We've, we've pampered too many people. The karate school started handing out belts like they were candy. Um, they, they, they became a point where students weren't even allowed to fail their belt tests. In, in my day, you didn't pass your belt test, you didn't get your belt and you learned to live with it and move on and train again harder and pass it the next time. Nowadays, we're setting up people for failure left and right because we're not learning them, we're not teaching them how to fail. And I think that's, I think that's critical. Dimitri, your thoughts on uh, any of the things that were said in the conversation? Uh, yes, I, 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 I agree that I think we're probably drifting in a uh, wrong uh, direction, although um, going on, on Catherine's uh, uh, comments, um, I think it's you know, no doubt that the, the ancient Greeks and the Romans and in ancient times, people had to face uh, both themselves and death. Uh, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords. Although, you know, there's a, there's a separate argument to, to argue as well that nowadays the lethality of, of, of weapons um, is extremely um, advanced. So um, warriors that are going out to fight, like American warriors or, you know, that go to the Middle East, um, you know, the, these people, I, I think we should not um, take anything from them since, you know, they, they are um, uh, certainly have the uh, both... The, the, the fighting spirit, but also courage to, to kind of meet this type of uh, this type of danger. Uh, but again, I, I, I do think that um, drifting in a direction where, you know, like you said, giving a black belt just because you don't want to hurt a child's feelings, uh, you know, this is certainly not going to create the next generation of warriors. Well, Costa, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, about training uh, because uh, you know just going back to these. Um, archeological artifacts. You see all these vases, you see all these um, you know, artifacts that show tremendous training, by the way, where you show a master usually with a little stick and people wrestling this and that. And we do know that some of these um, you know, combat sports were actually involved in the Olympic games early on from the sixth century BC. Uh, for a thousand years, uh, you know, uh, people were involved in these, uh, in these martial arts. And there was a tremendous amount of training involved. It was part of the culture. And again, you, you mentioned it to me, I believe, where you said, you know, you know, training is not done, you know, even though they talk about the martial arts, people being in the villages, protecting themselves from other people. These were not farmers, basically, that, that became the experts in, in, in martial arts. Can you, can you just go in, into that in a little depth about the Actually, training? If I could, I'd like to segue from the, the, the previous conversation because it's important. Uh, we haven't only lost the type of training that, that uh, we of the older generation uh, went through. Uh, we've lost our contact with nature. I mean, uh, how many children today think that uh, meat comes packaged in the supermarket and you open up a little plastic pack and you, you know, you eat your, uh, your steak? Uh, how many young uh, Kids have, have seen an animal butchered or, or, or washed it bees or taken a walk in the mountains, you know, uh, this type of thing. We've become, let alone, you know, working a field or, or, or having to, uh, to actually do that type of uh, manual labor. If, if we've become disconnected from nature, then, then this also reflects in any type of martial education. When, when the, the people who came up with the systems that, that experienced all, all of us uh, older practitioners here uh, they also grew up in a society that you know you walked to work 
you know, you, you, you drank fresh milk and, you know, you went to the butcher who butchered the meat and or maybe you butchered it yourself on the farm or, you know, your uncle did or something like that. But you knew where it came from. So uh, the, the, our society has become, let's say, more complex by all the logistics that are involved in, in making our life comfortable. And what we're talking about is reactivating and recapturing a primal essence very much a part of, of what we're discussing and, and refining it, making the sword again, the, the spiritual sword inside, because basically that's, that's what we're talking about uh, in a society that uh, has rejected that sword. I'm not saying it can't be done. It's been done many times, but we have to look at what we're, we're experiencing in the general context of what's happening all over. And we also must be careful when we're talking about uh, martial arts and martial education, even in the Hellenic context, uh, between that and, and combat sports. Because combat sports can have, uh, pronounced training in, in combat sports can have a very different effect. If you look at the, uh, the Iliad, the boxer Epios wasn't a, a very good warrior, you know, and he would uh, when they bothered, they teased him about that. He would say, well, none of you can stand against me in the, in the ring. Uh, Aristophanes actually goes as far to mock combat, combat uh, athletes in his uh, play Aftolikos, where he says, uh, let me see if I can remember it now, uh, what discus thrower, what uh, big strong athlete that can punch a, a lower jaw well ever served his, uh, his homeland on the battlefield? Will they uh, break through the row of shields with their, with their kicks? And then he goes, nobody that uh, has ever actually experienced the battlefield believes in stupid things like this, okay? <laughs> and, and there were, you know, there, there was a controversy. Uh, you know, Alexander was against combat sports, for example. That's why the famous battle uh, happened in a, an Athenian soldier and a Macedonian soldier where the Athenian soldier who was a Pangratian athlete, but also obviously new military uh, combatives, uh, came out and, and fought off the Macedonian with a club, therefore proving the benefits of combat sports. So it's always been kind of like a scale as far as, as what we're talking about, uh, you know, doing wrestling, doing this. Uh, I consider it as Again, what uh, Cleopolis said, metronariston, you know, you, you, you have to keep the balance in what you're doing. You know, if, if you flip the balance and you're, you're trying to make champions, then chances are you're going to make people who are going to be, and, and we see it today, right, in, in, in modern combat sports. They're emotionally imbalanced. They're, you know, uh, they behave uh, outside of the rings uh, like, uh, like thugs in many respects. And the reason for that is you need that type of energy, that type of psychology in order to be able to defeat your opponent in the ring. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about uh, programs that were created to educate society how to stand up for itself. Yeah. And this is, this is the core that, that everybody is touching, you know, and then we're, we're bouncing around it uh, when we're describing different things. For example, the, 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 the hard training that, that Catherine described, that Peter described, yeah, but both of you were there and you stood it. Why? Because in your background, in the life, in society itself, you were taught that you must endure this in order to get past it. Yeah? There was nobody that was grabbing you by the hand and saying, Peter, I'm going to call social services. You know, my lawyer will. Yeah, none of that happened. It's society itself was ready to embrace this type of training, okay? Society was also ready to balance it out. Why? Because as Catherine said, it was real. There were still wolves and bears in the fields. If you went five kilometers out of the village, out of the village you could run into something mean and, you know, it was- Like my neighbor in Florida. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Eric, Eric, your thoughts on uh, you know the difference between warrior art and combat sport? So, so you'll notice through history that what what happens, you start out with skill acquisition drills, then you come out with a game where you can define one one was able to triumph over the opponent, which is symbolic death, if you will. 
The problem comes in when you focus on that module, which is supposed to train you under duress in a non-lethal way, and it goes, it takes on a life of its own. Uh, for instance, go ahead. No, no, that's it. That's how I said that. It's a perfect, perfect wording. So that is that is specifically the problem. So, so what, what has been, I think, misinterpreted what I'm doing here, and again, this is coming from, from correlation with what cost has been. We actually, actually have released the rules and we went through a, a stage of uh, progression. We're training them in mechanics, but the entry point into the system varies by age. So the young men, we decided, you know what? We can, we can train them in the mechanics by engaging them in the active sport module. And at the same time, they're learning de-escalation because once you understand the rules, and I've actually had some doctors, of course they're Greek, attend the uh, training set, some of the seminars, they're actually fascinated by how everything we're doing correlates to the anatomy they know. So one phase, I'm showing them heavy equipment, how you hit, but they don't really know anything yet. But they jump into the game and it's lethal. So they've accepted, wait a minute, now I, can't, I have to watch how I move in normal life because I could be dead in 30, 60 seconds. So there's a lethality involved once you understand the rules. On the other side, if I'm training them mechanically, they do better at the game. But on the other hand, if someone comes in and tries to club you around, somebody that's very precise with their defense, you draw the rubber knife and you tap an artery and it's over. So it doesn't matter how you're shouting or anything, the game is done. So there's not really a focus on the game other than as a tool for progression. And that is actually where I, I think what I think is very important. In fact, uh, geniuses such as um, founder of Ike uh, Judo, they had a sport module and that whole, the, the, the point was originally that they were focusing on that as an instrumentation, as a martial art of development. It wasn't meant to go out on its own. It was meant to stay in the context of something bigger. Go back into Greek history and that's what happened, I believe. Catherine, your thoughts on uh, the difference between warrior art and combat sport? There is no difference. There's no difference no in your difference. mind? No difference. Um, there is no difference, and I put my neck on it. Don't put um, your neck on it. Don't put <laughs> I put my neck on it. Because, because if the teachers, trainers have the mentality of teaching you or bringing out of you your best self, your strong self, your the best self possible, and teaching you as if it is what you do in matter of life and death, take that and execute it on the competition arena you will be a champion. Now, well, you, 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 you certainly are a champion, so, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> so you're talking about the core training, the, the, the depth of the training is what you're talking about, development of character itself. No. Character is developed by intensity of training. Mm -hmm. We can talk about character development and drink wine or uso if you like, chipuro. Chipuro, chipuro, But, chipuro. <laughs> but uh, we will learn about the spirit and the strength. We will not become strong, maybe strong drinkers. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to develop strong people, you have to put them through uh, hot calls. They have to pass hot calls. Now, I came first out of a traditional school. I trained for 11 years. And the first tournament I attended, it was because they told me to go. I took a second place. But I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to present myself, nothing. It's just that I took from the dojo, from the school, to the, um, the competition floor. However, this kind of training makes you alert, makes you, you know, you know what's happening. You're awake, you're not like... So the second time, 
I never took a second place for seven years. Seven, seven years national champion. Okay, but where did that come from? From a teacher, because he was ruthless. Every Saturday, we run Central Park barefoot, winter or summer. Do that now. <laughs> now, my formative years, you know, my father was an officer. So I used to go and see soldiers exercise. It's, it's not a coincidence that I'm, you know, I'm criminal um, forensic psychologist. And I saw it because I've been to three wars, three conflicts. And I have combined my training and military training as well. So if you have good, strong, tyrant teacher, <laughs> you will succeed in sports. Very good. If you have sports attitude teachers, you will fail or kick, you know, get your butt kicked in the street. <laughs> Louis, if, if, I can, if I can add one quick thing on this whole thing, yeah. I think one of the key components about the warrior, like the military or tactical arts versus sports, is in any sort of administration, any sort of societal construct, we always face the problem of means versus ends, where we create something for a certain means, we create a program, we create sports to pride and to, to develop something. But inevitably, what ends up happening is what starts off as a means to something becomes the end in of itself. The sport becomes the end. The, you know, the conflict becomes the end. And the original purpose of the training gets lost in sort of the, in, in the history of this coming out. And I think that's the line is, is if you have a sport or if you have these sports sort of combats, you can't lose, fact, lose sight of the fact that it's not the end all and be all. It's actually a means to something else and you can't lose track of that something else that it was originally intended to accomplish. So that was the one thing that I was gonna to add to that. Peter, let me, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question. You, you obviously were involved in uh, various disciplines of the martial arts. Uh, which one would you advise someone to train in if you had to? It depends on the person, it really does. I think every martial art has its pro and every martial art has its con and every martial art has its beauty and every martial art has its blemish if you will and it really depends on the individual person themselves in terms of what they're looking for um it could be cultural it could be you know um different things like when i was young i was very passive and my, that's actually what got me into the martial arts my parents were more more concerned about my passivity than me getting hurt in martial arts um, so a certain martial art that had a certain level of aggressiveness was kind of what they were hoping for to get me out of their passivity. If you have someone who's already very naturally aggressive and you put them into a martial art that just exacerbates that, I don't know if that's necessarily what you want to accomplish. So it really depends on what you want to accomplish and what you want to come out of it. Um, I studied in, in many different disciplines. And one of the things that I came out of is I learned more about one martial art by actually studying a different martial art. Because then when I started studying that discipline, it really gave me an appreciation for what I had before and really understood the application. Uh, for example, you know, I decided to leave kickboxing for a period of time and just focus on grappling. Then all of a sudden I couldn't strike and I couldn't kick and I'm seeing opportunities where that would come in and say, oh, that's how this applies <laughs> because now I can't do it anymore. Um, so anyway, so th that's sort of my advice. It really depends on the individual person um, and they need to find something that fits them at that time. And sometimes that changes and evolves. Although, of course, a, a, a plug, of course, they, everyone should study Pamahon at some point in their lives. Of course. So we'll, put that plug we'll, in there. We'll, we'll, um, we'll, get to, we'll get to that in a second. Let me, let but me other, than that, other than that, I would say, you know, it depends on the individual. Dimitri, let me ask you a question. I'll give you another quote, and uh, you know, I'd like your reaction to this. Uh, this is from Mark Twain. Good judgment is the result of experience, and experience the result of bad judgment. Yes. Um, very good. I, yeah, I, 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 it certainly resonates with me, and it, and it resonates with what Peter just uh, uh, said as well. 
um, as far as your question as what's, you know, what art you should study. And I think it all goes back to, um, you know, what Peter said is once you start learning a different art, then you actually see the benefits of the previous art that, that you're actually seeing. And so mistakes that you were making or, or uh, if you were getting hit, I, I, going back a little bit to, um, to, to how it used to kind of be the, the martial arts. And, and obviously I came into it a little bit later than, um, than most of you, but, um, and I grew up with stories where they, you know, they would say, yes, in the seventies and the eighties, one school would go and challenge another school. And then, you know, you would just, you know, beat the hell out of each other to figure out which art actually was the best art. Uh, and so I started in the nineties, uh, which was more of like when MMA was also coming about. And so, you know, coming from a striking background, you know, we always look down on the wrestlers and the grapplers thinking that, oh no, the, the, the wrestler were to shoot on me, I would just knee him in the, in the head and then that would be the end of that. What, what I think the sport of martial arts within MMA has actually shown is that you actually are very one dimensional if you're only uh, thinking you're going to strike or uh, if you're only going to grapple. Uh, and I think that has kind of really shown uh, and both in that Mark Twain uh, 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 quote is that once you start trying to spar or, or, or interact with the wrestlers, I realize that, yeah, there's, there's definitely way, you know, there's, there's things that I need to learn that I just don't know. And it's more of ignorance. So to that extent, I think the MMA world has kind of shown that, although I do agree that because it's become an end in itself that, and, and, and the amount of money that you make now, uh, it's actually become sensational, sensationalized, and it's much more of a theater and people's egos versus actually being humble and trying to figure out who has the best, uh, you know, how to, how to become a better fighter. Thank you. I think Eric well, has a comment as well. Yeah. Could, I, could, I, could I go off with Peter and Dimitri? Yes, please, Eric, go ahead. Please. I, I, have, I have two points. So my point tactically, if you're in a sport, and there's a technique that can, someone can jab a knife into your kidney or slash your carotid, your technique is bad. Which gets into why the sport module we have, which is, uh, we call it, uh, it's a module number three, lethal. But what gets back to Peter's comment? What martial art you engage in depends on the person. So what Costa has set up is a system, you escape combatives, submission combatives, lethal combatives. When you look at it linearly, it makes sense, but it also makes sense that if someone comes to train with me and they're more aggressive, especially the older guys, because we throw them into that module that's very active, they go back into escape combatives. So I have the levity to work on, to pull them into escape combatives and, and throw them back into submission combatives, taking in the tactical parameters of blades and codes of operation for other, other tools and up back up to lethal. So we actually have the ability and obviously the neurophysiological components navigating up and down. So for it to go back down, if you may have seen the clips, Lou, I've been showing my daughter training in, in certain aspects on heavy equipment. Uh, one of the things I like to show is the picture of popping go. And you say, what were they doing? Were they carrying a uh, 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 pickaxe, strike through a subclavian artery, or are they striking the throat? My daughter's sitting there slamming the heavy bag with her arm. And I go through other movements that correlate to the eight movements we practice. She can, you can't do that in sport. Right? You're not going to walk into a sport and hit between C1, 3, C1, C3. There's a reason for that. Go back into our sport module. You actually can do that same thing. So I, I'm addressing both. So the, the parameterization of what you're doing in calibration of safety can be taken care of. Very interesting. Uh, Costa, historically, martial arts uh, have empowered nations in times of crisis. Uh, this has been proven by examples of, let's say, uh, Japanese Judo, Korean Taekwondo, Israeli uh, Krav Maga, Philippine Kali, and many others. Can a Hellenic uh, martial arts method uh, help empower men and women of Hellenic descent all over the world and bring together the diaspora and the homeland to a common purpose? Well, I think it can, but uh, like the Hellenic Revolution, it, it has to be brought in from the diaspora and it has to be independent of politics in Greece. Actually, it can work if you remove Greece. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, let, let me. <laughs> I, I think I said the same thing, but a little bit more. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. You know, you know my, you know my feelings about a lot of things. I believe we're in danger. I believe I kept, I kept saying for years actually. At last, wake up. At yep. last, wake up. Right. And 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 this is a serious, uh, serious question for me. In other words. What we're talking about today is, is not really discussed anywhere in, uh, in uh, the Hellenic world uh, to a certain degree. They may think of martial artists as sports, etc. But what you guys were talking about was a history of martial arts. What you were talking about, Costa, was, was something that was taking place in Elas in the 1800s yes. after the revolution, where That's people correct. were being trained. The training also in other areas which were occupied. Uh, how do we bring that back? I mean, this is a very important question. How do we bring that back? Well, I, I, can, I can voice my opinion. Uh, martial arts are very popular in Greece. There's a lot of them. All the styles are there. They're, they're, they're very pronounced. And, and the good thing about that is uh, it's clear, it's evidence that it's still within the psyche of the people to pursue this type of thing. Uh, the, the, there's the unrest behind it, you know, there's an attraction to it. And it's always been there. It's always been there. Um, now, as far as the, the Hellenic military uh, is concerned, just as a side note and, and as a plug, we have nothing to worry about. The guys who are professionals, I, I wish I could disclose uh, some of the... Uh, that I've heard, uh, you know. Don't do it, don't do it. No, no, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I, but, but I will say as a conclusion that we have nothing to worry about from that aspect. I mean, these guys are, uh, well, let me put it uh, this way. Uh, it is rightfully so that Hellenic pilots are, are uh, chosen every year as the best in NATO. This is public information. And let me say <laughs> that they're the same way in the other armed forces as well. OK, so side note aside, we, we don't have to worry about that. As a society, though, uh, there are issues that martial arts can help with. Uh, when the original attempt at a Hellenic martial art came out, which was the Pangratian Federation uh, in 94 or 95, uh, if I remember correctly, um, everyone was hopeful, but uh, it was botched. It was mishandled for multiple reasons we don't need to go into. Uh, a lot of money was spent, and the end result is that Pangratio now belongs as intellectual property to the UWW, outside of Greece. So there really is no benefit for Greece and Greeks by pursuing it anymore. It's, it's gone. Uh, if a martial art of the sort that, that you're describing that, that could become like a Greek judo or, or a Greek taekwondo or, or a Greek krav maga or something like that, Yes. For me, it would have to come from outside, from the diaspora in, and it could not be granted to the government for control. Because the second that that happens, and, and again, I've been part of... Uh, by the government, excuse me, Costa, by the government, you mean the Hellenic government? By the Hellenic government, yes. Okay. I've been part of multiple federations, okay? I, I, I belong to a number of them uh, over the last 30 years since I moved to Greece. The people who are in charge are either political uh, appointees or, and, and what I mean, when I say political appointees, I mean that people have nothing to do with the sport. Okay, so uh, this guy is uh, responsible for judo. Okay, let's put this guy here from this party, but he's never done judo. Oh, we don't care. We'll put him there, you know. And then the problem is that uh, all the people who grew up with this type of behavior have learned to acquiesce to it. Okay, so they just say yes, and they try to do their own thing, and they'll wait for their opportunity. No, if you want to affect change, to bring improvement into Greece through what you mentioned, a martial arts system, like the Filikieteria itself, it has to come from outside, sponsored by the by the Greeks of the diaspora, and brought into Greece that way as an independent entity. I'm convinced of that. This is that it's been scratching at me uh, for the last 30 years. I am a member of the Pangratio Federation. I'm a certified teacher, blah, blah, blah. No, it cannot be involved with Hellenic politics. It has to be independent of it, and it has to have the charter to integrate the diaspora with 
the homeland, uh, the people of the diaspora with the people of the homeland. And clearly, we see uh, in everyday political decisions that they have drawn a line between the people in the homeland that are Greek citizens and those of us in the diaspora, which there's there's more than a million of us now. Some even would say even though two, we were born here. Or, yeah. Even though we were born here. Right. They're trying to, to control us and sequester us. This is unacceptable. That's why I'm saying again, yes, it's possible, Lou. It has to be done this way. One, two, three. So, so in, in your mind, one second, uh, one second, Eric, and I'll get to that because obviously you're in the United States. So I'm very interested in, in your thoughts about the diaspora. But there is there is certainly a disconnect between between the Elas, let's say, and the diaspora. It's not discussed openly. It's, uh, you know, no one has had a serious discussion on it. I probably will have a serious discussion on this, but there's no doubt that there's a serious disconnect between the homeland and the diaspora. Many people don't look at us as Hellenic people. The only time they're interested is when they come over to the diaspora asking for money. Okay, that's all they're concerned about. They don't give, excuse my expression, a crap about us. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Eric, I interrupted. No, no, actually, actually, what I was going to say was exactly along those lines. So this guy named Costa that's on here now and, and myself, uh, we came up with it. We drew a gauntlet in 2015. Uh, people talk about Oki Day in the Pindos Mountains. We went to Costa's village to train my two sons. Uh, I think they were 10 and no, 11 and 9 at the time. You can see video of it. Uh, we show video of them running through the village, the Horya, and we showed them training because we thought it was very important to make a statement at that time, um, which is actually, there's more of a history with Papingo that's far, far more compelling too, but we, we have video of this. You know, it actually was making a statement at that point in time, which I believe carries forth exactly what we're talking about. Catherine, you had a few words to say and yeah, uh, we interrupted. I, I, just, I just wanted to uh, mention two things. First, uh, what uh, Peter Girigotis uh, said about, uh, you know, selecting, you know, just select the style, okay? I just wanted to add to this that select a teacher. If you go in to the dojo, to the school, to the club, just to learn certain sport, okay, you need a coach. But if you want to learn what we were talking about, the fighting spirit, you need a teacher. And if you go to a huge school, then I don't think the teacher there has time for you, okay? So I went to Japan because I was, I wanted to be at the source and I wanted to be with teachers. And it's not because they're gonna teach me, I was already made, I, you know, I went to Japan after I finished my amateur career. I was searching for teachers. And the teacher, you can't go to a seminar for a teacher. You have to be next to him, live, breathe, hear him. And how he lives, because he lives it, that's what can transfer into you. And the second point uh, with uh, Costa Derveni Sensei, I came to Greece to give. However, I live in Greece now, but I do all of my activities internationally. Um, it doesn't uh, stop me from being a Greek. But I would, now that I know that I cannot have the results that I want, 
from the Greeks. I get them from the rest of the world and the world is big. So if you want to do something concerning diaspora, do it. Let the Greeks from Greece come there. <laughs> yes. Catherine, I totally, I totally, I totally agree with you. By the way, and uh, we're going to have to end this discussion today. It's been a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating discussion uh, in terms of a, a topic that's very important. Obviously, I want all of you to come back. Okay, in other words, this has been too short. Uh, we can't have the audience obviously listening for a long period of time. Uh, you don't want to do it more than an hour and a half because uh, people, you know, at some point tune off. But this discussion in particular of how to make this happen, as Costa would say, in the diaspora and bring it back. And as you would say, Catherine, in terms, in terms of it taking place internationally is a topic that we have to discuss to figure out how I we can do it. I know how to do it. <laughs> The you know how to do it, and we're going to bring you on board because we're going to do it. The headquarters, the headquarters will be in another country. <laughs> the will happen here. We're going to do it, Catherine. We're going to. By do the it. way, Lou, th yes. this is not prearranged. I did not coach Catherine. <laughs> we did not discuss it. No, it's just. This is her speaking. <laughs> hey, listen, Catherine is the world champion, man. That's right. And there's, a, and there's a reason for it because she has the spirit. And when there Catherine you go. says, when Catherine says, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. So uh, <laughs> this is not going to be the last event that we have around this particular topic. The next time, we're not going to talk about the ancient days. We're going to talk about the modern days and what we do to do it, as Catherine would say. Yes. Uh, for the, yes. For the audience, I'd like to thank you uh, all for being on board. To the panelists, you are fantastic. You are wonderful. You're you're the world's best, and uh, you brought a lot of enlightenment to this particular topic. Uh, for the audience, in a couple of weeks, our next event is going to be on the Hellenic Dual Citizenship Initiative uh, on the 200th anniversary of the Hellenic Revolution. Now, why am I having this event? Uh, two reasons. Number one, we have the 200th anniversary that's coming up, and I did form the American Hellenic uh, Revolution of 1821 Bicentennial Committee. I call it the American Hellenic because it's coming from the diaspora. And part of the already, we have headquarters already. <laughs> no, exactly. And part of and part of the reason why I decided to do this initiative in the diaspora <laughs> is because in a last. They don't want us to become dual citizens. Exactly. So, so quite frankly, <laughs> the revolution, and by the way, I'm having another event in the future about, about, about the diaspora and its <laughs> effects on the revolution of 1821, because as we know, the revolution was called for by the diaspora. <laughs> as we know, we're going to do it from Rigas Pereos to Colocotronis. So somebody may say, Colocotronis, what are you talking about? He's Greek. Ah, Kolokotronis was in the diaspora. He came back for the revolution. So thank you again to the audience. Uh, uh, join us in a couple of weeks when we have the Hellenic Dual Citizenship Initiative. Uh, we are going to have some, uh, some international attorneys relating to this issue. We're going to have uh, Dr. Kutras, who is the general counsel of the Hellenic uh, Republic Embassy or, or consulate here in New York. And we will try to get, if we can, uh, the Deputy Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs relating to the diaspora, uh, uh, Mr. Vlasis. Uh, we will see if we can do it. But part of the reason why I'm having it also, I'm a dual citizen. I'm a dual citizen. My son has made an application and six years later, he doesn't have his dual citizenship. Why is that? <laughs> okay. I don't know if I'm going to ask that question. Did but I don't know. you guys are... the armed forces? Huh? Did he serve in the military in Greece? No, no, he didn't, but but you don't have to. No, 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 Catherine. First of all, he was born in the diaspora. Second of all, he's in the UAE, in the, in the, in the UAE. So let me say this one thing. We have a birthright that's part of the Hellenic laws, a birthright that our forefathers wanted us 
to become Hellenic citizens. And we can't have the Hellenic government cause us not to become Hellenic citizens on the 200th anniversary of the Hellenic Revolution. Yes. I read it. I read it. Yes, 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 yes. And Dr. Yasas, and thank you all. You are the thank best. You, thank you, Luke. Thank you very much. By the way, we're all going to get together. Catherine, I will see you in Athens uh, this coming year. Eric, I will see you. Dimitri, you I will absolutely you see you in New York. And Bye, Peter, everyone. the same thing. Yasas, thank guys. you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.